You're listening to the Elephant in the Room Property Podcast, where the big things that never get talked about actually get talked about. I'm Veronica Morgan, real estate agent, buyer's agent and co-host of Fox Hills Location, Location, Location Australia. And I'm Chris Bates, financial planner, mortgage broker and wealth coach. And together, we're going to uncover who's really making the decisions when you buy a property. I have to say I'm extremely disappointed that I couldn't be part of this interview. I did actually have man flu on the day, but this is an interview with a difference and you'll want to listen on to find out what our guest says about what's actually missing in the whole housing affordability debate. This discussion also looks at alternative models of property investment, whether there's a future for individual and institutional investors to provide affordable housing. Even from a, at a macro level, you know, in the, in the lead up to, uh, to our election in the near future, you know, there, there is no point talking about jobs and growth unless those jobs and growth are able to be, you know, realised by people living in houses that they can afford. Please stick around for this week's Elephant Rider Boot Camp. And we have a cracking Dumbo of the Week coming up. Before we get started, everything we talk about on this podcast is general in nature and should never be considered to be personal financial advice. If you're looking to get advice, please seek the help of a licensed financial advisor or buyer's agent. They will tailor and document their advice to your personal circumstances. Now let's get cracking. In this episode, we're going to look at housing differently. We often speak of property investment, capital growth, and of course, given where we live and work, a lot of our conversations revolve around property located in the very expensive inner ring suburbs of Sydney. But not everybody can afford to live here and not everybody can afford to buy their own home. And yet we all need to live somewhere. And the provision of affordable housing is something that we need to be aware of as a society. And we've had conversations with a number of people about different investment models, fractional investing, co-living, build to rent being just a few of the concepts that we've been discussing. But there is a reticence amongst institutional investors around getting involved in some of these spaces. So in this episode, we're picking the brains of somebody who is actively involved in the not-for-profit space, and we're going to find out the difference between social housing and affordable housing. Michelle Adair was appointed as CEO of the Housing Trust 18 months ago. Based in Wollongong, this organisation builds and manages affordable housing for people on a very low to moderate income. They currently have over 1,100 properties, over 2,500 tenants, and they plan to double the portfolio in five years. Michelle's got a team of 45. There's revenue in the last financial year was $17.5 million, and there's $156 million in assets on their balance sheet. So it's a significant operation. Now, Michelle has previously held national executive positions with the Smith family and Mission Australia, so she will be able to share valuable insights with us on the extent of the housing needs in Australia. A few months ago when I first met Michelle, I was very interested to hear what she had to say about the commercial opportunities in providing affordable housing as well as the social aspects. So I expect this will be a very enlightening conversation on a number of levels. So thank you so much for joining us, Michelle. Great to be here. Unfortunately, Chris isn't here to join us in this conversation, which is a bit of a bugger really because he was really looking forward to it. He's got quite a big social bent (laughs) and he had a load of questions to ask you. So I've got a few here. But this, this conversation is really about housing affordability, but real housing affordability, not simply just first home buyers wanting to get onto the ladder. So what are the gaps as you see it in the current system? Well, look, I mean, the first part of the conversation really is about what does it actually mean to be able to afford to put a roof over your head? And the common accepted understanding based on all the economic data is that if any household is spending 30% or more of total household income, either in rent or in mortgage repayments, then they're in housing stress. And that means that it's only, you know, one really serious illness, one bad car accident, a child suddenly arrives in the family with a significant disability. Any of those sorts of things, all of those sorts of things that happen to all of our families and all of our friends, you know, every, every week of the year, really, can throw that household into really crisis circumstances and into homelessness potentially. So that's the issue uh, when we're talking about affordability is how much have you got left over as a bit of a buffer? And and we're not just talking, you know, about smashed avocado for brekkie. We're talking about being able to educate your kids. We're being, you know, we're talking about being able to uh, to meet, you know, life's unexpected curveballs as well. And that's really interesting because that's, you'd say, oh, well, just get insured. But I guess if you are already struggling to afford 
to put a roof over your head, you don't have any money left to insure yourself, do you, for these, you know, things that could happen. And if you're talking about, you know, income protection insurance, it usually doesn't kick in for, you know, 12 weeks or something. So you're in trouble straight away. Mm. I mean, the the stats around uh, the number of households that are in housing stress are terrifying. I mean, nationally, we're talking 260, 280,000 households just in the Wollongong local government area in oh the last... Oh, my God. So that's not the oh, whole yeah. of Australia. Yeah, no. <laughs> no, no, no. no, no. Um, so <laughs> just, uh, just in the... Oh, no, the, those... No, 260 odd is nationally but right, okay. but just in but just in the Wollongong local government area we've got 8000 households in that category i mean that's that's more than 10% uh, of the, of the total council area in Wollongong mm. that's potentially at, on the brink of homelessness and that's in addition to people that we know are homeless and we've got about 1100 1200 we estimate so is that a location dependent statistic, i.e., you know, are certain areas more likely to have higher levels of that? Absolutely. And Wollongong, relative to household income, is the third most expensive city in Australia behind Sydney and Melbourne. Is Uh, it? Yeah. So, and, you know, interestingly, Wollongong and the Illawarra more broadly, you know, we get caught we're not really regional and we're not really metropolitan, mm. which often means we miss out on the policy benefits and, and initiatives that are otherwise uh, invested into growing Western Sydney or trying to really promote, you know, more regional parts in our case of New South Wales. And and we're not either and uh, often get missed. What's what's the population of Wollongong? Uh, about a couple of hundred thousand. Yeah, okay. so we've got 74,000 households. Mm. So it's about the same size as Hobart. Mm-hmm. Roughly. Mm-hmm. <laughs> <And> yeah, <laughs> there you go. Which sort of, it's funny, isn't it? Because, you know, when we're looking at data, we talk about capital city data, for instance, and Hobart is, I think, the 12th biggest city in Australia. Yeah. Yet, yeah, Wollongong doesn't make the list. And I think there would have been a really sound argument for thinking about Sydney, greater, you know, regional Sydney as, uh, as a four-city metropolis rather than only having three, and Wollongong would have made sense in my view. Yeah, it's, well, it's certainly pretty close and it's got a great train line that, that services it. So, um, yeah. Oh, there are tens of thousands of people that commute from Wollongong to Sydney every day for work. Mm, it's wow. extraordinary. Yeah, yeah, wow. And so what? So you think it's a bit, a bit neglected by the governments? Totally. You're yeah, yeah totally. And, and you're saying that that is one of the causes for the fact you've got, well, why is it so expensive? Why is it the third most expensive oh, metropolis? because... It's a stunning place to live. I mean, the coast and the mountains mm. and the lifestyle is, is brilliant. And it has, until fa- fairly recently, been more affordable than Sydney. But, of course, that's becoming more and more difficult. So we're finding that increasingly people are needing to move uh, further south and further west. And, you know, the northern northern suburbs, places like Austinmere and Bulleye and Thoreau, are as expensive as any fabulous beachside suburb uh, mm. in Sydney these days, and for good reason. And it is unique in the sense that that train line does run along the coast. Yeah. So you can actually live on the coast, on the beach practically, and get on the train and go either to Wollongong or to Sydney for work. So and we've got Wollongong University is, is outstanding, absolutely world-class in a number of fields. We've got mm. terrific teaching hospital in Wollongong Hospital. So it's got everything it needs. So you've got these pressures, which are good things for property investors, but not so great for the people who are you know, under pressure financially. And increasingly, you know, it's not a good thing for property investors when the market's looking like it's going to continue to, to tank for a little while. It's difficult. I mean, the other, the other difficulty for the Illawarra region uh, is that we are sandwiched between the coast and the mountains and mm. a lot of the land in between is actually floodplain. So it's, it's difficult to actually get access to uh, large new uh, greenfield sites. And that's interesting. Okay, so the affordability piece is interesting on a number of levels. I mean, there's a lot of discussions around being able to offer uh, affordable accommodation for, you know, your nurses and your teachers and AMBOs and, and et cetera, et cetera, in our support services. And obviously if Wollongong's struggling or, or suffering under affordability, then, you know, look, there's so much debate around this. And so what are your thoughts on that? The, you know, the idea that you, we need to provide affordable housing so that everyone can live in a in a city. It's a city that only caters for the high-income earners is unbalanced. Who is going to look after those high-income earners and who is going to provide the services for the city to run? And so what are your thoughts on, on those sorts of issues? Well, there's... It's a human right. It is a fundamental human right to be able to have safe, affordable 
housing. It, it, it is, and it's actually recognised by the Human Rights Commission. So mm. that's got to be a given. The difficulties that we have, and there are two types of, I guess, official perspectives on housing uh, affordability in the rental market. So mm. let's, let's set aside purchasing. Uh, and they're people whose incomes are so low and that typically means their only income is going to be some form of, of government payment. And they are typically eligible then for social housing. Uh, and that's the only official list that we have of people. Um, so in New South Wales, the government keeps a list, the housing pathways list. And there are tens of thousands of people on that list. Uh, nationally, we are 500,000 homes short. So in, again, just to take Wollongong, for example, as a, as a bit of a microcosm, uh, I've got over 3,300 people on the social housing waiting list. The typical wait is uh, five to 10 years. The government doesn't bother to keep lists after that because if you're waiting for 10 years, like was waiting for 10 years. Um, the massive increase, particularly in older women uh, and older couples on the list, means that uh, people literally uh, die waiting. So um, between 2017 and 2018, again, just taking the Wollongong LGA as an example, uh, the waiting list for social housing uh, in, in that area, in, so these are the clients that we, that we exist to try and help and serve, uh, reduced by 10 and two of those people died. Natural attrition. And so, you know, that's that's the social housing waiting list. When someone who is eligible for social housing is, is able to get a home, and it's very scarce, then they pay uh, 25% of their income, which keeps them under that 30% right. threshold that yep. we're talking about. So regardless of what the market rent is, that's mm. what they pay. Okay. The next category of people uh, are the affordable rentals and there's no lists. We don't actually know. So we use the ABS data around housing stress to get a um, bit of a gauge on how many people are in that category. And that's where absolutely you've got your essential workers, um, but you've also got these days, increasingly, you know, young professionals, you've got all the, all the, you know, kids that are, you know, working their way through uni and um, pulling beers and all the cafe owners. Um, you've got all, all the white collar workers, you know, in admin roles, um, clerks, you've got all the retail shop assistants, um, you've got data entry people, you know, huge volumes, just about, you know, every cross section of society is going to be in that category. And some really concerning government data about the future of jobs growth and mm. uh, and where careers are going to go over the next, you know, 10 to 20 years. Um, and of the 10 biggest growth areas for increase in terms of employment prospects into the future, six out of 10 of those jobs and careers are in the lowest paid income levels. So this problem is not going to go away anytime soon. Mm. We've got to have fundamental economic policy and systemic change to reform it and to make a difference. Now, we'll get into what your organisation does shortly, but what I'm interested in understanding is that, okay, so it's government that provides social housing, right? Uh, New South, well, it's a combination of Commonwealth mm. um, provide typically um, the Commonwealth rent assistance for those social housing um, um, eligibility people. And then there are a range, um, states differ, but in New South Wales, then the New South Wales government provides um, social housing. So um, LAC, the land and Land and Housing Corporation, and organisations like mine, registered community housing providers with a capital CHP, we're a whole regulated industry sector, yeah. um, and uh, we also provide it both, uh, we manage it on behalf um, of the government, New South Wales government, but we also have our own stock. So some of some of our stock is um, social housing yeah. and some of it is also affordable. Okay, and I'll get into how that sort of stacks up from a, someone's got a own it, someone's got to build it, someone's got to run it, you know what I mean? Like obviously yep. there's a lot of cost involved yep. with providing this housing um, and we know, well, I mean, look, let's face it, I don't know, have you ever watched Houseos? <laughs> I mean, <laughs> it's, um, no, I mean, look, I, sorry, I mean, I'm just trying to, <laughs> um, there's a lot of stigma around it and, and I know certainly I live in inner Sydney and there's a lot of housing commission as we used to call it. Now it's called social housing, correct? And you can see that there's been a lot of obvious government policy over the years in terms of how this social housing should be provided. So you look at in Waterloo, where he, we are in Waterloo, bordering on Redfern, and there's those big towers that often 
fondly called suicide towers. Um, you know, I don't think they look like very joyous places to live. Um, then you've got, obviously, you've got sort of the, the post-war uh, stock that, you know, I used to live in Balmain and so there's a lot of that around there and so that's filled quite often with a lot of old people that live in those those um, complexes. Then you've got, obviously, out further west and, and um, where you've got, say, Macquarie Fields, for instance, I understand that there's entire... Um, uh, developments and sort of townhouses and complexes. And, and actually I used to live in Annandale and there was actually a townhouse complex very close, which is all so- social housing. So you can almost sort of – and then I've seen in Roselle and Lilyfield they've been knocking down a lot of these post-war ones and rebuilding them and changing them and trying to put in mixed – mixed housing. There's a whole, you can see almost carbon date when these buildings have been, or the complex has been built. And obviously there's been a lot of failures in all of that, but there's also a bit of a perception and, and please um, tell me if I'm wrong here, but there's a bit of a perception that if there's a long waiting list and if people, it, it's so hard to get it, that when you get it, what's the incentive to actually get yourself out of that hole? You've just You've just given us probably enough to talk about for the next six months. Right. Okay. So let, Sorry. Let me, no, That's no, one no, huge no, no. It's cool. Question. No, it's cool. <laughs> no, no, it's cool. Let, but let's try and unpick that. So mm. you're absolutely spot on when you talk about um, the failures of previous um, architecture, urban planning, construction design. We have historically, and we are still needing to unpick and unpack and undo. And um, demolish. Yeah, yeah absolutely. <laughs> yeah, and for really good reason, um, mistakes of the past. Um, and we know um, from a whole range of disciplines that we can either uh, help to reduce or completely alleviate, alleviate and eliminate um, social problems through good urban design mm. uh, in the same way that bad, you know, bad design uh, can perpetuate it and create it. So let's park that and, and in that acknowledge that for the individuals that are living um, through necessity because there simply is nowhere else. Mm. It's not their fault that they're in those disasters. Mm. And, in fact, we know that 66% of people who are homeless and in housing crisis um, are there as a direct consequence of um, health or social and economic failures. So it's not their fault. Yeah. So um, we, we just have to embrace the fact that not everybody can just pick themselves up and get on with life um, in the way that um, others are able to. The, the changes that are necessary are those things. It's around, it's around good urban design and good planning. The implications and the actual experience is that about uh, 20% of social housing tenants do continue to live significantly with mental health um, issues. Um, they are indeed victims of domestic violence and so there is a, a household, sadly, and an intergenerational experience of violence and abuse being a, uh, being a reasonable response to situations. But these days, just you don't have to look much past social um, you know, so, social experiments on TV programs to see that this stuff is yes. being perpetual. I mean, God, what a nightmare. Um, but <laughs> I think I know what you're referring to there and I watched it. I got so sucked into that. But it's it, it's just a horror story. Scary, so, yeah. so uh, you know, and they don't look like social housing tenants. No. Uh, and so, you know, there's this whole mess around, uh, around abusive behaviour mm. and violence. Talk to any private real estate agent and they will tell you that, yes, of course, they have you know, well-paid, full-time employed tenants who have wild parties on a Saturday night who, you know, cause social disruption. So my tenants are no different. Um, yeah. And and in fact, uh, the tenants that um, are living in homes provided by community housing providers like, like the Housing Trust, like us, um, are proactively managed. We, we directly engage with our tenants. We get to know them mm. so that if things start to come unstuck and we notice that maybe their rent, you know, they're paying their rent fantastically regularly every week for years. And then they start to miss or it gets a bit late or, yeah. or you know, suddenly, you know, we'll be, we'll be you know, driving by and, and notice that the lawns are, are less cared for. Um, we can pick up the phone and, and say, hey, is there something wrong? And because we actually really know our tenants, we manage our portfolios very proactively so that um, we can provide referrals to mm. other sorts of support. And, and inevitably, the vast majority of people get back on track. 
So, you know, there's a whole bunch of differences um, and uh, it's just it's just wrong to uh, only associate um, people on very low incomes uh, as being the only members of our society that, that live with difficulties and, and challenges. So I guess what you're saying there about the ways in which you proactively assist your tenants, it's the same principle for any property manager. Like if you're going to be an investor in property, you really want to choose a property manager well and obviously you're doing a great job as a property manager. Now, who is providing the housing? So all state governments, so in New South Wales, of course, New South Wales state government has um, an enormous amount of their own stock. Um, But over the last eight to 10 years, there's been a really, really sound and a very successful, well-informed policy, um, at least particularly from the government's point of view, um, of doing stock transfers. So organisations like like the Housing Trust, like mine, um, are registered community housing providers. And we receive, we can bid for and receive stock transfers. Now, the whole purpose of that um, is that it boosts our balance sheets so that we can then enter into commercial loans in our own right uh, to be able to, you know, do new property developments, do acquisitions. I was actually really interested in your introduction when you described us as a not-for-profit because, like, crikey, <laughs> you know, my board would go nuts. I, I, I might have, I might have uh, charitable status, but I'm very much a for-purpose organisation. Right. Uh, I've got to deliver a, uh, a profit. I have got to manage my cash flow. I've got to, you know, uh, maximise my LVRs and, and, all, <laughs> and all those other hugely commercial, very sound things. Um, the community housing sector is actually, I think, that, the, you know, the perfect social enterprise. It's just um, that we we manage our profits to be able to reinvest back into more housing. And so is that what not-for-profit really means? Is basically... It's profit for purpose. Yeah, okay, got it's, it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And oh, it, no, thanks for taking me up on that. No, it's, it's cool. Good, yeah. I, it's, and, you know, who wants to be defined by what they're not? Mm. And uh, I can assure you, I, I'm, I'm making a profit. So it's a reinvestment of that profit? Completely. Yeah, okay, as Completely. opposed to shareholders taking the profit. Absolutely right. And, okay. you know, there's even from a, at a macro level, you know, in the, in the lead up to, uh, to our election in the near future, you know, there, there is no point talking about jobs and growth unless those jobs and growth are able to be, you know, realised by people <laughs> living in houses that they can afford. I'm sorry, but, you know, politicians don't like a slogan that's got more than three words in it, <laughs> jobs and growth, Yeah, but, you know. But, you know, look, the reality is you, you just can't keep any part of your life together or put one foot in front of the other for any sustainable period of time unless you've got a safe, affordable roof over your head. You yeah, know, you just you can't educate your kids. You you can't hold a job. You can't manage your health. You you just can't do anything. Well, it's Maslow's hierarchy of needs. Totally. I mean, it's the fun. Mind you, apparently you add two layers for millennials. Oh, is that right? Underneath a roof over your head, you've got battery, and you've got Wi-Fi. <laughs> okay. Anyway, that's just a little bit of it. And to be and, and solar on the top. It's supposed to be funny. <laughs> um, okay, so yes, so therefore, okay, so you're not. It's for purpose, so that's, I'll get my, my own vernacular correct there. Okay, so it's for purpose, but it's not all provided by government, right? The no, housing. definitely not. No, no definitely not. So um, my organisation, we, um, we own uh, a third of our stock. Okay. So of our 1,100 or so, um, we own a third of it. We are classic property managers for New South Wales government for about a third um, and we also look after and think that there's actually enormous potential for us to do a lot more with private investors mm. um, so that we can um, look after uh, their leasehold properties for them. And and increasingly, and you know, I think particularly these days, more and more people are, are recognising that um, there are opportunities where you can, you know, perhaps not completely max out um, your financial returns, um, but in being more modest, you can actually make a difference in your communities and and still make a good return, still still protect your assets, still have capital growth over a period of time, um, but you don't have to you know squeeze every last cent out of out of rent. And I am, you know most people I'm sure would agree that you know a very modest compromise perhaps in in rental income for guaranteed security and guaranteed you know, rental income is is worth a, a small a small clip on their weekly amounts. 
Well, it's interesting because, I mean, yes, there wouldn't be any vacancy rates, would there? <laughs> Just clearly with, with that amount of demand. <laughs> that, that, that's exactly right. So, and, well, it's, it's actually true. And some of the other work that I'm doing is looking at um, helping to position community housing as uh, a global asset class for investment. Mm. Um, that can and will be able to uh, attract uh, investment from uh, superannuation funds. Increasingly, you know, particularly industry super funds, uh, their members are saying quite rightly to the trustees, uh, what are you doing about community investment? Yes, we're doing some Mm. good stuff socially. Yes, we're doing some good stuff environmentally. What else are you doing now uh, around um, community housing? And certainly community housing is, and housing more broadly, we know now, is much more appropriately described as a part of social infrastructure than it is just about the property sector. Um, mm. We have guaranteed cash flows. We've got, you know, leases for 10, 20 years, um, and that's quite unique. We don't enter into um, property purchases and, and developments um, on a speculatively, you know, high um, high turnover, you know, quick turnover sale. We, we're in the market for, you know, 10, 20, 30 years without, mm. a, without a, a problem at all. Which is sort of interesting because, I mean, that certainly fits in my own philosophy uh, around, you know, property is a long-term investment. And so people are trying to be speculative. Well, that's not property investing. That's just gambling. Um, okay. So, you know, I don't I don't know the answers on the capital growth side of things. And of course, I, I always think that that's something that needs to be absolutely thoroughly investigated. However, um, in terms of private investment, what sort of investor would come to you? Somebody who owns an entire building, somebody who just wants to actually buy an apartment for argument's sake or a house or townhouse? How does Uh, it work? Both. Absolutely. So at the moment, um, I'm working, um, I'm putting a deal together with uh, a private um, builder, construction developer. Um, We're looking at uh, 110 uh, new apartments built in two six-storey towers. Uh, Great location, just south of Wollongong. Um, in uh, still in the in the Wollongong LGA, um, and we will take uh, a ten by ten year um, lease and option for the whole lot, and um, that uh, will allow us. He will have um, guaranteed rent. He will never have an empty apartment um, or a week a week without rent. Uh, we're still argy barging about uh, the finer details of who's paying maintenance on which bits of it. Mm-hmm. We will typically look after all of the apartments. He'll look after um, the public common areas. Um, he doesn't have any. So this is and this is a design we'll actually do together. So we're gonna we're gonna co-design it. Right. Yep. Uh, we're gonna make sure that we're not over-engineering. Um, you know, en suites everywhere and <laughs> double you know double yeah. garages and you know um, really schmick laundries. <laughs> We just don't need that stuff. Mm, yeah, um, they can be good quality homes um, without being really upmarket. So uh, he doesn't have any of the strata fees. He doesn't have uh, any of the marketing costs. You know, there's a whole bunch of advantages, and um, we're very confident. There have been a number of test cases now on an individual case by case basis of tax rulings that allow him to write off the difference between his market rent and the rent that he's getting for affordable. Um, from us for affordable tenants. So we would take uh, a head lease. He's only got um, one person to deal with, not Mm. 110, and it's a good deal for everybody and it's going to make a fabulous contribution. Um, We will carefully um, advertise and and make sure that we mix up the tenant profile so it's just like every other building and it will look like every other building. Nobody wants, as you you were describing before, um, to repeat the mistakes of the 50s and 60s. We're just not going to do that. Um, and there's no reason to. And it's very interesting because I would imagine there's not a lot of developers that have the capacity, the financial capacity to hold onto a building for that amount of time. You know, most of them are relying on pre-sales in order to actually get the finance to build the thing. Um, It varies a lot. Uh, it varies a lot. And, and I think, um, you know, with the success of the last couple of years, there might be more that are in a position to do that than others. It certainly helps. <laughs> there might be some desperate to, to <laughs> there do might some be. deals with you because they can't sell them. Well, you know, I'll, I'll leave you some business cards. Uh, yeah, look, uh, that's true. Um, and and certainly um, some others um, might have, have done very nicely with pre-sales already for buildings that are, you know, either fully complete or, or well and truly progressed. Uh, again, you know, guarantee Guaranteed income from a community housing provider um, for a 
percentage of that stock is is a great thing to do. It's really smart. Are you finding um, that? Are you getting a lot of pressure from refugees or from from new immigrants in the Illawarra? Uh, yes, uh, there is there is a large refugee community, um, but um, no larger than Tasmania, for example, mm. or, or some parts of Western Sydney. Uh, and again, the issues of of affordability, um, no no barriers in terms of age or ethnicity or place of birth no, or origin. But I guess mm. if we've got a, a waiting list, it's over ten years long already. Mm-hmm. How do, how does that? How do they get accommodated? Um, they live in housing stress, and they're technically uh, technically meeting the definitions, many of them, of, of homelessness. So homelessness isn't just roughly sleeping. Um, um, a lot of people think that that. That's what it must mean. Mm. Um, but it means um, much more than that. It means um, uh, living in a place that is um, that is not suitable for you. So it might mean overcrowding. Um, it might mean um, living with um, intergeneral, intergenerational. So it might mean a, a young family having absolutely no choice but to move back in with their parents mm. and then to overcrowd. Right. It might it might mean um, older older people you know moving in with their kids. Um, it might mean squeezing you know extra, extra bedrooms. Obviously you know the the couch surfing, yeah. uh, which sounds you know like a fun thing that you might have done by choice when, when you, you were eighteen, 18 yeah. exactly right after a Saturday <laughs> yeah. night. But um, when you know, I mean, I personally, I uh, my kids when they were in their in their late teens came to me one day and said, Mum, can can this particular friend of theirs that, I, that I'd known for some time, can he come and stay with us? Um, his um, his mum's drinking again and he's got nowhere to be. And we pulled a mattress out from the back of the garage and put it on the floor. Now, that kid was technically homeless yeah. um, because this wasn't his home and it was a short-term solution. He happened to live with us for three and a half months. But um, you know that that's that's a part of so many lives these days. Yeah, because I, I was going to ask you with with a waiting list that long, and what are people doing? Well, um, so a tenant of ours who's who's been living in one of our units in Wollongong now for about two and a half years. Uh, she was a nurse at Westmead Hospital, and she's I won't name her, but she she has told her story in the media before, so I'm not going to breach her privacy or. Her, uh, her trust. So she was a nurse at Westmead Hospital. She had an accident, couldn't work. Um, she was already in a violent relationship. She had two teenage sons. Um, she was the primary income earner as um, she had to take a break to, uh, to deal with her, her injury and to recover. She wasn't working um, and so her husband's violence increased because of the financial stress. And over a period of time, uh, then her eldest son started beating her as well and um, she had no alternative but to get in her car and literally just drive away from the home that she had known for 20 years. Uh, She lived in and out of crisis women's refuges and transitional services, which typically only provide a maximum of 28 days accommodation. Uh, she lived um, between crisis refuges and motels that are often used to provide crisis accommodation and uh, transitional accommodation for four and a half years before we were able to give her a home. That's just traumatic. At I mean, every level. She's probably got PTSD now, right? I Absolutely. Mean, yeah. Absolutely. She lives, she lives with um, the consequences and will forever, not just of being in a violent marriage, but not ha- of, not having anywhere safe to go after absolutely yeah. absolutely and 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 the loss of of uh, of her relationship with with her sons as well and um and and again um this is a nurse in hospital she was a well educated um, you know professional yeah. successful career woman someone that you would no. just imagine no. is your stereotypical no we had <clears throat> you know we um i mean there there are just so many stories you know we um we're building Five more homes, affordable homes now in in Coromel. We've just had the CC for seven more in in Shell Harbour Council in a suburb called Flinders. And um, you know, one of the one of the dads um, that's um, going to be, we're pretty sure, taking one of the homes in Coromel. Uh, he and his wife have three children under seven, 
and um, their two eldest, uh, two boys, um, were both diagnosed with quite significant autism, um, but at sort of two and three. Um, and they hadn't realised, and, and one of the boys also has, um, has quite significant hearing loss. And they applied for 70 private rental properties in six months. But because they were a single income, because my you know stays home to deal with the needs of, of two special special needs children, um, and three kids, single income, seventy private landlords knocked them back. Oh, so okay. So we've currently got organisations such as yourself. Um, and I guess we probably should mention here, if people are in crisis, I, I can't imagine that there's <laughs> probably nobody listening to this podcast is in crisis, but if you ever come across somebody who is or you know someone who is, where can people go to get help? Look, um, I mean, one of the one of the places to actually to start to try and navigate is, is your local Centrelink office, actually. Right. Uh, as frustrating and as slow and as confusing and <laughs> as difficult as all of that is, the mm. cynic in me would suggest that sometimes Slightly our governments <laughs> make this stuff deliberately difficult yeah. uh, and don't get me started on the NDIS, <laughs> um, then, you know, um, but that's an option. Um, mm. and, and certainly um, all of the really well-known, wonderful organisations like Mission Australia and the Benevolent Society and Catholic Care and lots and lots and lots of others, um, you probably won't uh, immediately easily find your way to community housing providers like mm. us, but certainly all those other broad-spectrum community support organisations will help you. It we'll starts you on the process. Yeah. Yep. So what do you think of the ALP's policy to encourage investors to provide, what is it, um, I think it's 250,000 houses over the next decade. What do you think of that policy? It's fabulous. Um, it's, it's, the first, uh, it's the first new fresh policy and commitment um, to affordable housing um, for a very long time. Um, the Liberal Coalition Commonwealth Government um, passed legislation just last year to establish the, um, the NIFIC, and the acronym for that is the National Housing Finance and Investment Corporation, so the NIFIC for short, NIFIC. thankfully. <laughs> uh, the NIFIC's got two, um, two really substantial vehicles. One is that they provide um, low-cost loans to registered housing providers like us um, so that we can do what I was describing yep. before, um, you know, borrow and, and, and grow stock and grow our balance sheets. Um, but they also have uh, a grant um, stream as well that can be used for infrastructure. So for private developers that would not otherwise um, be looking to create social and affordable housing stock. So one of the one of the projects that I'm looking at at the moment, um, we will um, certainly be applying uh, to cover all of the civil works uh, for a project um, that would not otherwise be cost effective for that particular developer to allow us to partner with them and to come into the estate. So, so that's a really good thing. Um, the the recognition, I think, for me, one of the really critical things is that we change and broaden this perspective that, as again, as, as you were describing earlier, housing affordability is not just the purchase price of entry mm. uh, yeah. as a homeowner. Um, it is how do we increase the um, amount of affordable rental stock. So, um, so the, you know, the ALP's recognition and commitment um, is significant. NRAS, um, Again, uh, the National Rental Affordability Scheme. <laughs> NRAS. There you go, NRAS. Yep. Mm -hmm. um, that was uh, first rolled out a number of years ago, and uh, there were some there were some policy mistakes, frankly, in that. Mm. There were some um, just pretty suboptimal um, deals and and loans and things done. But for the most part, um, it was a fantastic stimulus package and investment. And Labor's commitment to um, a new version of NRAS, if they're elected, um, will be, in my view and, and um, the industry's view, um, a very significant stimulus uh, to help, I guess, alleviate some of the, the ongoing downturn and, and um, problems that, that we're facing in, in you know, reduced um, applications and approvals. Yeah. And look, I guess, you know, I've always got to think about 
you know, one of the things that I often find from property managers, so individual property managers in areas that are, have, you know, that are lower socioeconomic areas, um, one of the issues that they often have is that, now I'm, I'm trying to be careful not to generalise here, but but there are certain certain types of areas where you get, uh, you know, the individual investor and their property is not treated well by the tenant. Now, I guess part of that, as you have suggested, is how it's managed and, you know, screening of tenants and all the rest of it. When we look, when, when I talk about um, investment fundamentals for property investors and individual investors that are, that are buying one property, you've got one shot at it. You've got to really buy a, a property that is going to help you deliver your own financial future, right? So, and that's taking the, the, the pressure off the governments and taking pressure off the future governments as well, right? And so I'm very much in favour of us all taking responsibility for what we can do in our lives. And so, but at the same time, obviously, there is huge affordability issue with and the right of us all to have a safe roof over our heads or a safe place to live. Um, and so I don't want to take away from that either. There are times, though, when people make or create their own unsafety, right? Keep going. So, so if you're if you're the abuser, and I, and I know that people who abuse, like the, the the husband who beat his wife, the nurse, I know that he was probably abused himself in his childhood, and it just goes back multi generational. I get that. I get that he is just not some evil man, and obviously his sons are now learning how to how to do that from him, and that is society in in, in societal sense. That's our big issue in many ways, right? But that person, him, he's probably in mental stress too, right? He doesn't earn an income. She was the primary income earner. He is going to live somewhere, Yep. right? Yep. Does he then become a tenant that then doesn't actually value the place? And you know, I, I'm just I'm just trying to be a bit of a devil's advocate here because from an investor's point of view, these are really real concerns. Yeah, they are. And look, I think um, bottom line is... Um, Bad, unacceptable behaviour, whether that's um, whether that's you know interpersonal violence, whether it's poor property care, whether it's um, irresponsible financial management, so you're not paying your bills when you can, um, refusing to learn how to budget, and you know if you've if you've got a limited income, doing what you can to put some aside. Um, poor behaviour cannot and must not be facilitated and supported. Um, we will always, and I think it is perfectly appropriate and reasonable. We do it in all parts. We, uh, you, know, you do it with your staff. Mm. You know, somebody makes a mistake, they mess up. You don't kick them out first time around. You say, let's have a conversation about this. This is not okay. These are the rules. Is there anything I can do to, you know, support you to avoid that mistake in the future? Um, what are you going to do to avoid that mistake in the future? And we proactively manage it, you know. It's no different with with tenants. Uh, what are the rules? Hold them accountable. Mm. Follow up with them. Um, and let me tell you, my staff are at NCAT every time they need to be. Yeah. Uh, okay. It's and and we don't we don't. It, it is simply not acceptable. Um, but nor is it acceptable, frankly, for so much of the New South Wales government own housing stock, and often some of the stock that they transfer to to providers like us, to be substandard. Mm. It is not acceptable. Yeah. You know, if you if you're living in a dump, why should you? Mm. Um, take pride in it. This is not okay. Yeah. So again, um, the opportunities and, and the importance um, of renewal and refreshing stock and of mixed tenancies are good, sound economic policy and, and um, social investments. Yeah. And, you know, I think that, um, what did you say? The word you use, it's like integration. What's... Um um, well, I, I just don't think it's, I don't think it's worked in the past to quarantine people no, in need. No, no, no. Um, you no. know, they've got to integrate. In with well, we, I mean, one of the other policy frameworks that we're very supportive of is inclusionary zoning. Um, so that about 15%, only 15% mm. um, of, of all new big large-scale developments um, is made available to people on low to moderate incomes. Okay, And, and that's, a, that's a good sensible thing to do. Yeah, we touched on that earlier actually in terms of being able to provide um, housing for essential services, for argument's sake. Um, and so with that, do developers, are developers offered specific incentives in order to do that? Look, we, we can now. And and certainly the New South Wales 
um, government's uh, opportunity to extend SEP 70 across the state is is a fantastic initiative mm. and and something we've been screaming out for from um, the Illawarra for ages. So that's a really good thing to do. It still needs to be science specific. Um, and that certainly gives um, developers um, FSR concessions and, and sometimes height concessions and a few other bits and pieces. So that's a really good thing to do. Mm. Um, how that actually plays out, uh, I think we certainly often the devil is in the detail um, and individual councils need to be very careful and we certainly socially need to be very mindful to hold um, hold councils and, and the parts of the system that are involved accountable for making sure um, that any of those SEP 70 concessions do in fact result in additional stock, mm. um, that we're not just you know, collecting fees and money and somewhere along the line, you know, it's there's the layers of bureaucracy that, you know, kind of reduce the capital. So um, that's a that's a good initiative, and and it it changes, you know, and and I think unfortunately one of the other really difficult realities of the way so much of the property development, particularly in some parts of Sydney, has occurred in the last few years. Let's be honest; some of the stuff is really ugly, oh, awful, it's rubbish, and it's just it, yeah. it is rubbish. Mm. It looks bad. Yeah. It's not going to stack up. No. Nah. Um, and you know, it, it's just put a really, um, a really nasty note, um, on, on our industry and on our sector, uh, mm. in, in ways that we have to change and we have to accept responsibility for turning around. So, um, oh, yeah, but that hasn't just been built for, you know, your sector. Sure. Oh, no, you know, absolutely just not. Building, absolutely not. You know, so that spruikers can flog it to unwitting investors. There's so much stock that is what we call investor stock, which is really not desirable for anyone to no, live in. No, it's 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 absolutely disgraceful. Um, and um, so, you know, there are appropriately community concerns about conversations of, you know, medium or higher density and where mm. we do that. And uh, and again, it's, it's part of the very, very strong argument. Um, again, the New South Wales government, good on them. We've now got a Minister for Housing again. Mm. Uh, and it's been taken out of uh, family and social services and put into um, infrastructure and planning. And that's a really good, smart, appropriate policy decision. Yeah. Uh, and we need a we need a Commonwealth Minister for Housing too. Mm. It, it's very important, <laughs> isn't it? Yeah. Well, and, and again, um, you know, Labor at a Commonwealth level uh, are talking about um, very specifically seeing housing um, being embedded within treasury and infrastructure, mm. uh, which is an appropriate place to put it. And what are your thoughts on the build to rent model? Uh, it's great. Uh, it can work, but it needs it needs to be thoughtfully and deliberately designed. Um, there are um, we we know enormous layers of cost and mm. and duplication that that make it difficult. So. For my sector, one of the contributions that particularly state governments can make and, and Commonwealth governments can make is make the land available. You know, these are actually public assets. Oh, uh, yeah. Mm. You know, so make public land available for public good would be a good start rather than forcing charities like mine to compete in the open market with private developers for, a you know, a block of land. Oh, there's an issue. Yes. <laughs> um, <laughs> so um, so there would be, there would be an, a, a, an opportunity. Um, you know the two the two developments that I mentioned before um, in Flinders and in Coromel. You know, and you know, I've just written checks for tens of thousands of dollars of Section ninety four fees. Mm. I don't think that's helpful. Yeah. Um, from uh, a Councils. social a social yeah, yeah from a social community outcome. So that sort of stuff needs to be uh, revisited. Mm. Um, at the moment, without a degree of social outcome commitment, I wouldn't say it has to be philanthropic, but certainly until we can resolve some of the opportunities um, around APRA regulations to be able to attract things like superannuation investment um, mm. into built to rent, um, we've, we've got to have some broader policy reforms to, to make that uh, more accessible. Um, but again, it depends on your margin. You know, if, if, um, if, you're not, if you're not going to really have um, expectations of arguably excessive returns and mm. you're happy to make modest returns, then build to rink. Yeah, and it's it's an interesting one. Maybe we need to 
dive more into this as a topic, but it's interesting because margins, well, higher margins often come with higher risks. So, you know, it's of balancing course. all of that out. Of and that's, that's something that investors need to be very, very mindful of. And again, if, you, if you've got a, you know, a head-lease relationship um, for... Ours will be, um, you know, 10 years with a 10-year option. Mm. Um, and there's enough um, property stock within that lease to make it worth everybody's while. You've suddenly got a very different proposition on your hands and, and yeah. it can work. Mm. Every week we hear incredible stories about the dumb things that property buyers do. Dumb things that cost a lot of money and cause a whole lot of stress. Mistakes that can be avoided. Please, Michelle, do you have a property dumbo that you can tell us about? Because we can all learn what not to do from these stories. Wow. Um, that's really tricky. <laughs> it's meant to be. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, it worked. <laughs> um, you know, I think the dumbo for me, and this is probably going to potentially get me into a bit of a strife. <laughs> Even better. <laughs> yeah, yeah. The dumbo for me would be all layers of government, local, state and federal, mm-hmm. um, not getting the fact that none of their other policy frameworks, initiatives, ideas, grand plans or promises are going to amount to diddly squat unless <laughs> they actually acknowledge that affordable housing um, is the Maslow first plank mm. of every life and every bit of social and economic policy. It's right. really that simple. Yeah, no, I like that. So basically all the Band-Aids that have been applied all over the place are not really going to do a job until everyone has a safe place to call home. Absolutely. A safe, affordable Safe, home. affordable place. And I actually noticed on your website, and we will include the links to your Fabulous. website and some of the other things that we've talked about, your website does talk, use the word decent. And we had a bit of a chat in our office yesterday yeah. about that. I like the word decent. It's, uh, it's not over-promising, but it's, you know, decent, it's fair. You know, just decent fair. equals fairness. Yeah. And, and you know, um, I, I say to my staff, I say to our tenants um, around, uh, around our policies, around our maintenance program, around the homes that we build. Would you be happy and proud if your mum lived here? Would you be okay mm. to visit your kids if they lived here? And if you're not sure, then it's not okay. It probably means it's not a decent home and then it's not okay. Yeah. So, um, so yeah, a decent home for everybody is, is our vision and that's um, unequivocally what, what everybody on my team is, um, is turning up to try and do every day. Fantastic. Well, thank you so much for your time. Thank you. We want to make you a better elephant rider. And this week's elephant rider training is... It's all about choosing a property manager. Now, I have to say that we covered a lot of really, really interesting things with Michelle and some really thought-provoking things around the concept of a home and the rights of all of us to live in a safe, affordable home, which is the mandate of uh, Michelle's organisation. Now, one of the things that she did talk about was really their very, very careful management of tenants and the very proactive management of tenants. And, you know, that is a principle that we all need to look for when we're looking to hire or engage a property manager. We want to know that they are not just finding a tenant and they're just letting it go. We want to make sure that the property managers are actually looking after our investment. And and that's certainly all of those principles that Michelle was talking about in terms of their engagement with the tenants. You know, once if it looks like they're not paying the rent, for instance, getting involved early on, being proactive in terms of making suggestions and actually um, providing help and assistance for them. Those are all things that uh, any property manager can do if they choose to. And I know from experience there are a lot of property managers out there that actually do offer that level of service to their landlords and to their tenants. And so I would encourage you, if you are a property investor, to make sure that your property manager is proactively working with those tenants, making sure that those inspections are regular, so every quarter, that they are keeping on top of the rental payments. They're making sure that those tenants, if there are issues with the property, that they are being addressed, that they are bringing those issues to the property manager's attention because they do know they're going to be heard. All of those things are really important. It's not just in the affordable housing sector, it's in every housing sector. (music) 
Tune in next episode when we interview Kylie Walsh. She's a general manager of Dyer Jones and recently won an award for the most influential woman in real estate. Now, we did touch on women in real estate. We did have a good discussion about who's better, men or women. The answer may not be quite as obvious as you think. We also talked about transparency, how technology is going to improve things with regards to transparency for both buyers and sellers, and also um, country auctions. So slightly uh, divergent topics that we covered and a very interesting interview. Now, just quickly, don't forget that you can access the transcript for this episode on theelephantintheroom.com.au and don't forget to download our free full or forecaster report. Which experts can you trust to get it right? Get the report and find out. Don't forget we're on all the social channels. We're on Facebook, we're on LinkedIn, we're on Twitter. Please connect and send us a message. We'd love to hear from you. The Elephant in the Room property podcast is recorded at the Sydney Sound Brewery. This week's podcast was recorded by John Risk. Editorial by Gordy Fletcher. Until next week, don't be a dumbo. Now remember, everything we talked about on this podcast is general in nature and should never be considered to be personal financial advice. If you're looking to get advice, please seek the help of a licensed financial advisor or buyer's agent who will tailor and document their advice to your personal circumstances with a statement of advice.